This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon on a Friday, the last business day of the year. Wow, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. More specifically, it's Think Tech Asia. And today we have one of our other hosts, uh, Michael North. He's the managing partner of uh, Asia Pacific Group. And uh, his wife, Xiaofang Zhou, uh, she is also with Asia Pacific uh, Group. And we welcome you to the show, you guys. Thank you. Dave. Thank you. Yeah. So we're going to talk about changes in China. And, you know, try to get to see changes, because we live in a time when sometimes, you know, American politics get in the way of fully understanding what's going on in China. And I don't think people really understand how fast China moves, you know. Um, every time you look, it's different. You guys get to China pretty regularly. You can connect the dots. In fact, you just came back from China. Yeah. And one of the things that uh, you mentioned to me yesterday, Michael, which I wanted to cover, is a new attitude in China about immigration from other countries. Um, I'm not sure it's a change in the law, but maybe a change in the policy. And if not a change in the policy, that's in a change in the attitude of the government and the people you know who can express how this works um, to people, for, for example, from the United States, who would like to spend time. I have long recommended that kids, I mean young people, out of high school and college, uh, they want to have a gap year, they want to start their lives, they want to expose themselves to the world as it exists today, they got to go to China. Problem is, so few of them do. And that may be, you know, because of a sort of a, a historic, um, historic conception of China. China, which is, they see it as dirty, um, where um, people follow you around and ask you for money, uh, where the food is not so pure, um, and where the air is bad, you know, a, a place that maybe not, may not be all that attractive to some young person who lives a reasonably good life, middle class life in the United States. But here to tell, that's changing. It's changed. I mean, Russell Liu was on the, the show a couple days ago and explained, and he's been talking about this, that the air in Beijing is much better. Mm -hmm. That whatever the Chinese are doing, they are catching up. Um, and those, those old problems that people saw, maybe still see erroneously, uh, have been largely resolved and China's moving forward. And one of the things you mentioned is that the immigration policy uh, now would encourage young people to come to China, even make a life there. So I want to know more about that. Yeah, the change in immigration, it's, it's policy and it's law and it's practice. Uh, is, is pretty important. And I think that it's emblematic of a number of other changes in China. You know, over the past number of years, I've seen China grow from being in a learning phase, an acquiring phase, to being a confident phase, and now to being assertive. China and stand up. How do you very, say that in Mandarin? Yeah, that's China, China stand up. China stand up. I knew you'd say that. One, one, one more time. <laughs> China, China, I've heard that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the uh, famous words with which China was proclaimed to be a nation in 1949. Mm -hmm. And China has not only stood up, they've started to walk, and they're running. And they're definitely in the race. And I just, you know, each morning in Beijing, I pick up a copy of China Daily to remain in touch with things. I read the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times too, but kind of daily. And a couple of weeks ago, I spotted this story that I had heard some things about, but it really locked it in. And if you don't mind, let me read you Please. a couple of short This is quotes. from the China Daily. Now. Yes, from the front page. Uh, to attract more top overseas talent, the administration has made joint efforts with the Ministry of Human Resources and Social Security, as well as the Ministry of Public Security to simplify the visa application process from weeks to five days. Mm -hmm. Other preferential policies, including lowering the threshold for permanent resident applicants, has al have also been adopted. Uh, in the report, Xi Jinping, uh, the, the president of China, said, we should value people with talent, be good at identifying talent, have the foresight to employ them, be earnest to keep them, and welcome them into our ranks. Another official says that 
applications for work permits from foreign experts whose skills are in urgent demand, as well as top talent in all fields, will be streamlined next year to attract more talent. So these preferential policies reveal the country's openness and inclusiveness, which a great power could demonstrate to the world. Who, who, who owns China Daily? Uh, it's a government publication. Okay, so the, checking. Yeah. The Ministry of Information. Yes. Yeah. Um, but they express policy they on express behalf of policy, the government. Policy. They express ideas. They, you know, it's when you look at the cover of it, it's sort of like USA Today and the New York Times. There's features from all over the country. There's see, ChinaDaily.com.cn is a good bookmark to have on your mm, computer. Yeah. And yeah. if you if you want to see sort of how the other half lives, um, it's a very good barometer. And of course, one recognizes that it is official policy declared by the, by the government of China. So one takes it with a grain of salt, as one takes what the Washington Post says with a grain of salt as well, because they have an agenda, they have an editorial viewpoint, and there are many different viewpoints. Well, I think there's a lot of media in this country, good and bad, uh, who, who do China bashing even now. Uh, it's, and and it's that's, out of that's, ignorance. doesn't encourage young people to go to China when right. you see that happen. It's out of ignorance. It's yeah. out of the fact that they haven't been there. And even those who have been there have been to Tiananmen Square and the Great Wall, and they've gotten a surface impression. The way you might get an impression of America by going to Times Square and taking a quick walk through <laughs> Central Park. You know, there's, of course, Times Square and Central Park are wonderful and beautiful, but that doesn't define America any more than the tourist spots in Beijing define China. And so Fang and I, living and working there uh, pretty consistently over the past seven years, we've, we've gotten a window into what China really is. And of course, Fang was born there. You know, she was born... She's seen these changes, yeah. these sea changes. Oh, sure. She was born yeah. within a few blocks of Tiananmen Square mm. and has lived in America for 30 years and is a U.S. citizen now. So she's one of those rare people who who has a really thorough, deep understanding and love for both countries and uh, can effectively bridge. So without talking about her too much, let's uh, yeah, Shao Fang. hear from How Shao do you Fang. feel? I mean, there, there are, um, what's, what's, who is that artist? There was a lot of press about him, China artist, who spent a lot of time in the U.S. And he was, he was treated badly in China because of, he's very vocal about his views, way, way, Weiwei? Weiwei? Yeah. Weiwei, way, yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there are situations in China, tell me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. even today, even with the economic prosperity and all this and new policies, where people aren't treated well because of their political views, is that mm -hmm. still true? Well, I think it's, uh, it, it depends on where, 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 uh, where you stand. Where is your point? Uh, see China. There's a negative, there's a positive, and the positive people will see, even see the challenge will be um, in a positive way. Because, you know, China, just like the U.S., we have challenges, we have uh, issues, um, but people are people. We're mm -hmm. all the same, mm -hmm. sa mm -hmm. face the same challenges. Mm -hmm. um, I feel um, just been living there for last uh, almost two years, I, I really feel there's so much um, opening in China. Changing. And there's it's so becoming much more open. Yes. And uh, people are talking, you know, they could pretty much be talking everything. And people are happy. This is Freedom most important. Speech. Yeah. yeah. And they talk what they feel, how they feel. This is very different than, you know, 30 years ago. People don't like to talk much about their feelings. Yeah. Yeah. But now they... They're talking openly. And, so you won't uh, get thrown in jail if you so, speak your mind against the government. Well, they yeah, it, it's a from you know from the internal. They're happy. Yeah. And they express that, uh, um, you know, opportunities, and uh, um, the growth. Yeah. Yeah. Somehow this so, is rooted in the notion that <clears throat> if the government is serving the people well, that is creating prosperity, mm -hmm. providing you know, all the necessaries for them to live well, um, then the people don't complain. They like it. They're happy. They're yeah. happy with the government and the country. Um, but on the other hand, I think rooted in the Chinese culture, political culture, if you will, if the government is not providing for them, then the people have the right to yeah. 
upend as, it. As we do here. You know, uh, well, just, just open the paper here and uh, you'll see every single day people saying America is on the wrong path, we're doing the wrong thing, and you know, people have legitimate concerns and felt psychological concerns. You know, there's great injustice still in America to African Americans and people of, of races other than the Caucasian, right? And there's now we have a new awakening of, of women to see themselves in a truly equal light, which we thought we were all the way there to equality, right? But we realized that we really had some more steps to take. Yeah. So that does that mean that the government of the United States is failing its people and needs to be overthrown? No. It means that we need to speak, we need to exchange, and we need to, we need to have constructive criticism and grow. And I think within some limits, China is coming to that confident recognition of itself, that criticism is not necessarily destructive. They understand they've come from a time, you know, in the last hundred years, when they were emerged from feudalism, you know, dominated by centuries of the dead hand of the emperor, into a revolutionary time where they were a republic, into an ultra-revolutionary time where they freed themselves from multiple colonial empires, simultaneously fighting off invasions by the Japanese, and finally somehow became a country which was destitute on day one. People were starving, they were sick, they couldn't move through the country. There was no business, no universities. They, they came from almost, no, almost nothing after all that revolution and struggle in 1949. And look where they are now. What, but what happened with the Cultural Revolution? I need to ask you that. Oh. The Cultural Revolution was not a step forward. It was a step backward. Uh, me, and I, and the, I guess the that. most amazing thing is that China survived the Cultural Revolution yeah. and came out just fine. But it's not that long ago. It's not within loss of memory yet. Let me say this about that. The Cultural Revolution was based on a profound ideological revolution. They wanted to completely leave behind the feudal past, the past of exploitation, the past in which there were signs on stadiums in China that said, no dogs, no Chinese. They wanted to blow all that away, and everything had to go. The good with the bad, it all had to be destroyed in order to build a new world, right? And of course, they went way too far. And it was cruel. It was brutal. On its own and there were Yeah, and there were huge mistakes made in the process of trying to make that. And it wasn't a revolution, an economic revolution. It wasn't even a social it's revolution. An ideological revolution. It was a psychological revolution, mm. right? To, to, to set aside that dependency and that vulnerability, that sense of being a third-class citizen that many people in China had. And fortunately, there were enough people in the leadership of China, um, led by Zhou Enlai, who, you know, we've talked about him before, who had the good sense to preserve the best of the past while allowing the revolutionary winds to blow. During that period, was, Mike, during that period, Michael, it was, it was closed door. I mean, there was no room for anybody from the outside during right. that period. And I think that notion actually succeeded, continued after the Cultural Revolution. And it was not until, uh, uh, gee, I forget the, the leader who did this, but who opened it up economically um, and said, come on in, let's do business. Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping, yeah. So a question, you know, Michael mentioned uh, about Zhou Enlai. I, I've always had an affinity for Zhou Enlai since I, write, I wrote my class paper about it in 1953. Um, I thought he was a great guy. Uh, how would I then know that here today I'd be sitting with his granddaughter that is saying something? But let me, let me ask you, how has it been for your family since the time of Zhou Enlai? Well, first of all, I'm a grandniece. Of grandniece. Jordan. Okay, let's just yeah. get that straight. Yeah. And uh, you know, as a family member, we're no different than any other ordinary family. We don't feel ever special uh, because um, I was born in 1963 during the that was uh, after major I wrote my disaster. Paper. Yeah. Yeah. And then starting the Cultural Revolution. Um, so I never really met him uh, through my father and the family members, I, I 
I learned about Zhou Enlai, of course, and from school, the paper, you know, study. Mm, sure. um, so we grew up as just, uh, just like other ordinary family. How has it been for your family? How did they do in the Cultural Revolution? How did they do in business? How did they do in connecting with the government? Well, they are just the ordinary people. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father sent to uh, countryside. Uh, I was, uh, you know, maybe eight years old. And uh, I was having a blast because by visiting him in countryside and meet all those pigs and horses and dogs, uh, I loved it, you know. So I grew up without any deeper understanding, I guess, you know, still uh, to be able to see my father. I didn't know what happening. But after growing up, uh, especially now, I've been living in China, and uh, I thought about that question, you know, during the Cultural Revolution. And I have a little bit of deeper understanding. You know, even every country, they have to go through their own path. It's and, the human condition, isn't it? Yes, yes. And to see what, uh, what China come out from that, you know, how strong uh, the nation become. Yeah, that's really so, remarkable. Yeah. It's one of the great miracles of our time and our generation to see what happened. Exactly. And I want to, I wanna, yeah. after this break, uh, when we come back, I want to talk about what the opportunities are right now. All that considered, all the history and, and the economic success, this change in policy, this change in global vision uh, that Xi Jinping is bringing. Uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of a special time. And I want to examine how an American kid now, instead of like five or 10 years ago, now can take advantage of those things. We'll be right back with Michael North and, uh, sorry, I'm gonna say Deng Xiaoping, but I'll say Xiaofang <laughs> <laughs> Zhou. Thank you. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, and I'm here every other week on Mondays at two o'clock p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. In Hawaii Together, we talk with some of the most fascinating people in the islands, about working together, working together for a better economy, government, and society. So I invite you into our conversation every other Monday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Join us for Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Hello, everyone. I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. You know, the thing about China and, and every other country, especially in the last 100 and 118 years, mm -hmm. <laughs> is that heroes come and go. And sometimes they remain heroes forever. People always respect them, you know, for millennia forward. And sometimes, no. Sometimes it's a sine curve up and down. And, um, you know, I'm aware that, uh, that Joe and Lai had his ups and downs, too. And his memory has had its ups and downs, too. It's very interesting. Uh, but at the bottom of it, at the base, right now, 2018, uh, he's a hero. No? See? Am I right? Very yes. highly. There's, there's nobody, going to, nobody going to run him down right now. Mm -hmm. He is a people's premier, and uh, he passing 42 years. And people still in, you know, next year, it will be uh, his 120s uh, birthday. Yeah. And the whole nation will celebrate on yeah. that. Yeah, I want, to, I want you to know that I am not changing a word of my paper that I wrote <laughs> in 1953. I'm sure it was terrific. <laughs> <perfect. laughs> Which is a statement of admiration for him. Yeah. Anyway, let's, let's talk about the opportunities now. You know, I, I went to China for the first time in 2004. Okay, I was just amazed in, with the energy and the vitality of the place. Everybody I saw, everything I saw was was all completely vital. I'd never seen anything like it anywhere else in the world. Um, there were still rough edges and all that, but each time I, I've been there three times, each time I was there, I, I noticed that the rough edges were smoother now. I noticed that life was a little better for the average person. I wouldn't say the average Joe, but that's your family name. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. So, um, you know, so I, I want to know how it is. I mean, for example, um, we went to a neighborhood in Shanghai, which looked like it was in New York or Washington, 
which had uh, tables on the street with umbrellas mm -hmm. and restaurants and bars and yeah. all these middle class up and coming kids, people. Um, they were having such a good time. It was global, it was world class, and it was a statement of, of possibilities of uh, you know economic adventures for for the, for the up and coming generations and i'm sure it's like that now today there so you can have a good life are, right there are neighborhoods that are indistinguishable from brooklyn yeah yeah that are some of our favorite neighborhoods there are neighborhoods that are indistinguishable from rodeo drive too and there are rough places and there are rural places that have been largely untouched by all this prosperity mm. And there's a concerted effort to try to close that gap. Let's not have a rose, rosy eyed vision of China that everything is perfect um, in a nation of nearly 1.4 billion people. But there are certain things that are fundamental that are actually working pretty well. Yeah. Number one is it's safe. It is it's safe. not a lot of crime. It is safe and it's not dirty and people don't dirty, follow you and beg from you. And the food is reasonably good. The food is great. Yeah, food great. is Pardon incredibly me. varied. <laughs> you know, here in America, we normally we have Cantonese food with a little mm -hmm. Sichuan on the edge. But in China, there are a are hundred different varieties of food and so many different ingredients and spices and ways, ways of preparing. You never have the same meal twice. Yeah. And, and there are <clears throat> great places to live, I mean, reminiscent of, uh, of Manhattan, maybe the best parts of Manhattan. So I guess the question is, how do I get in, into this? Uh, how do I take advantage of this? Uh, especially in view of this new policy expressed in China News. Um, how, do I, how do I get started? Where do I go? Who do I talk to? What website do I view? Um, is it real? Is it going to be easy for me? Or, or do I have challenges? I mean, you know, in the past, there were challenges. I would not be accepted very well. I could. Yeah. Uh, I, they had to determine that I, and you mentioned this in, in reading that uh, article, I had to be valuable to the state. I had to be skilled. I had to be a special person, which is not dissimilar from a lot of the categories of immigration status here in this country, too, by the way. But how much of a barrier do, do I have to climb in order to get into the middle class in China? Live there, work there, enjoy uh, in, in Shanghai. Shintiandi. Shintiandi. That, that neighborhood with the, the tables and the Chinzano umbrellas and all that stuff. <laughs> so what do I have to do to get there? Well, for you, Jay, it would be relatively easy because you have training as a lawyer. And that's the skill that is very much there. You know, our mutual friend Roger Epstein is going to be spending three or four months there next year at JY University in Beijing as a visiting professor in international law. And that just happened through a referral, and he went there, met the dean last week, and he's been accepted, and he'll be there probably as long as he wants to be. That's the question I wanted to ask you. I mean, let's make Roger, Roger, forgive us, let's make Roger a case study here, uh -huh. okay? He's got his papers, he's got his job, it's all good. It's not going to make him rich, but it'll make him, you know, comfortable enough uh, living in Beijing. And he can stay there, as you say, for as long as he wants, because he's a real good uh, lawyer and a good teacher. Um, but what happens when he, quote, retires? What happens when he's not working anymore? What happens when his current you know, visa, whatever visa it is, was it a tourist visa, education visa, distinguished visitor, what is it? Uh, what happens when that expires? Is he going to have to leave? It'll be a visiting professor yeah. visa. And yeah, he would need to have enough funds saved, enough retirement to support himself, because he wouldn't be participating directly in the social security system in China. Same way because as, if, I, if I go there, I'm not going to participate in that either. That's right. not for me. It's for people right. who were born in... How right. about you, John? And people who have you, permanent you participate residence. in the social security system in China? No, not in China. Oh, yeah. here. <laughs> it's yes. better. But, you know, it's not guaranteed here either, you know. But you could get a uh, working permit. Yeah. 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 If I get a working permit, do the, I then begin to develop a retirement in China? Um... No, I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure there is, yeah, but yeah. it depends on your contract, yeah. I think. If yeah. you're a foreigner, maybe you're not yeah. eligible. See, what, yeah. I, what I'm really asking about is, you know, China people come, in fact, they come from all over the world to the U.S. and they make a life, like you. Uh, they become citizens. They make a life. They find a way to live, a, uh, you know, the, the life they wanted to have right here. And the U.S. up to this point, I'm at this point, we're at a kind of kind of a pivot right now, but at this point, you know, it's pretty available. It's pretty good. 
And I wonder if this is ever, if it's possible now in China, uh, and whether it will be, you know, is this opening the door to the point where I can say in five years, it'll be better, in five years is more likely, and I should tell my young son that when he's finished with uh, high school or college, and takes his gap year, he should go straight away to Beijing, get, get the papers he needs, go to Beijing, get a job, you know, find an apartment, and invest himself in that country. Um, <clears throat> now is the time when the door has finally really begun to open for foreigners. And, you know, especially with creative talent, uh, people who are artists, who are filmmakers, who are in the media, people who are writers, people who are translators and teachers of English, oh, that's really a high demand. And almost anybody who speaks English reasonably well and has some liberal arts education can teach English I have, a, I have a nephew who went to China by himself for a summer vacation years ago, landed in Shanghai, got a job, he's teaching in a primary school, he speaks very little Chinese even to this day, but they love him because he has such a great manner with people and he's so demonstrative and he, he, he has always interesting ways to introduce new words <clears throat> and the fact that he speaks no Chinese is actually an asset for him. So he never came back. He's been there for 13 years. He's happy in Shanghai. And the family keeps asking, when are you coming back? And he always says, no, I th maybe I'll try North Korea next. Oh, gee whiz. <laughs> <laughs> I'd hold up on that. <laughs> He's one of those really daring people. And you know, that 15 years ago or so, China was a very challenging place. And only really extraordinary people could handle that high curve. But I think now, Pretty much anybody with high energy and a belief in their talent, willingness to work hard, could, could find a way to, to contribute something. Am I going to be watched? Am I going to be on somebody's <laughs> data screen? Um, am I going to be at risk of saying something, you know, impolitic, uh, doing something that's really not, you know, not acceptable to the government there and losing my papers and getting thrown out? Does that happen? Is that changing? I haven't. I have no knowledge of that having happened to anybody that we know of the hundreds of people that we know who are there. Yeah. Um, so there, there is a firewall there, which makes it hard to get Google and YouTube and Facebook and stuff. Um, and I think that that firewall will start to come down. Ah, that will be yes. very interesting. This is a great thing to watch. But I have one last question for you guys. You're an interesting couple, you know, because you speak English, maybe not so much Mandarin. Speak Mandarin and plenty good English. You could live there. You you know the place. You know the right place and people and businesses and you know the way things work. Um, but here you are in the U.S. Why don't you move there and stay there? What's holding you back? Well, hmm. we actually have this year. I've spent more than half my time mm -hmm. in Beijing. We have a really nice home there, mm -hmm. and I really feel like it's home. And I feel like Hawaii Kai is home too. So it's possible to have two sets of roots in the world and two sets of parents and relationships. And, and we invite people from there to come here. We've got a delegation coming here in a few weeks of friends from, from China. And Hal Fong and I are working on a student exchange program to, being, to bring young Chinese students here for a summer and work and live uh, through University of Hawaii. So I, I don't think you have to see the world in, as, an, as an either or choice. Yeah, sure. That's the modern approach. Yeah. And certainly China doesn't see that either. I mean, it doesn't see it that way. Yeah. Uh, China is going global, and it's very interesting to watch that. To me, that's the most remarkable change of all, and it's all very, fairly recent. i tell you, there's a young uh, Chinese business entrepreneur, venture capitalist, who lives in Vancouver, Honolulu, and uh, Shenzhen. And he moves frequently between those three and stays in Airbnbs, bread and, bed and breakfast, in all three places. He has one big suitcase, and he has no home whatsoever. Why? His home is his suitcase. Why? What, what makes him do that? Because he has business opportunities that are Canada, U.S., and, and China, and he wants to cross-fertilize those opportunities. So what kind of a person should do this? You know, not everybody, not everybody is, is good at going to another culture. Not everybody is good at immersing himself or herself in another culture, especially China. It's, it's you know, different. <clears throat> and uh, 
uh, I think it's clear to me that some people like you, you are going to enjoy this. This is going to be a, a revelation and a, and a great gratification for you to be able to, you know, keep a foot in both camps that way and see the global process. But what can you distinguish for me? What kind of person is going to be able to do this? And what kind of person is not going to be able to do this? I think that for people in the 21st century has a global vision. You want to really understand the other side because those people are part of us as well. So to really understand China, for instance, you need to be there and the living and then see through your own eye and through your own experience to understand better maybe yourself, maybe um, for the work you do. Uh, it's always uh, a good thing to, to get to know yourself, your own country, and the others. See what is out there. Okay, I have one last question. I'll address it to Michael, and then we got to go. <clears throat> Michael, see that camera one over there? That's Donald Trump. I'd like you to give him your advice on what his policy ought to be toward China. You should recognize that China is the most natural partner for America from the fundamental instincts of people to be entrepreneurs, to build businesses, to create new things, and to explore new areas of mind and heart. China is a place where there are 1.4 billion customers for America, 1.4 billion partners for Americans, and they can be a tremendous amplifier of American prosperity if we form relationships with them personally, culturally, and in business that are founded on the principles of mutual respect and understanding and a willingness to step outside one's own skin and see how things look from the, from the vantage point of another person. And I would say that we are at a historic opportunity point with China, which is now reaching out across the world with their One Belt, One Road policy. To, there's now nearly 60 nations that are participating in this unprecedented growth outreach by China across the planet. And America has also reached out across the planet. Historically, since our origins, we've reached out and we've participated in the growth of many of the nations in the world, and we're respected for that. Thank and you, now Michael. there's a partner that's doing the same thing. Michael North and Xiaofang Zhou. Um, both of uh, Asia Pacific Group. Uh, so nice to talk to you. There's more to come. This is an exciting time. Thank you so much. Xie Xie. Thank you. Xie Xie Ni. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Xin Yun Huai Le. Thank you.